flipping on through Facebook a few days ago, something that I have not done in some time, I came across an article written by the daughter of Matt Slick. Some of you may not know him by name, but might know about his website or ministry, CARM, or Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. And the article written by his daughter was one that, on some level, seemed to announce her apostasy from the faith. And in this article, she gave some details about her upbringing and ultimately got to the point where she explained why it is she is no longer one who professes faith in Christ. And I could relate to this story, which is why it struck home for me. I have an 18-year-old son whom I raised entirely on my own. He was brought up in a Christian home, going to church, reading the Bible, etc. He professed the faith, though I was never convinced. And uh, shortly to after turning 18, before graduation, he moved out of my home and moved in with his girlfriend. Now, he hasn't verbally denied the faith, but he most certainly has by his actions. And this is quite heartbreaking for the Christian parent to deal with. Uh, sins of the father, I presume. But reading through this article, it was apparent that it was not one simple issue that led to her apostasy, Rachel's that is, but rather it was something of a process. Nevertheless, she pointed to one particular problem that, quote, sealed the deal for her. And the following are her words. She says, This changed one day during a conversation with my friend Alex, and I had a habit of bouncing theological questions off of him. And one particular day, I asked him this, If God was absolutely moral, because morality was absolute, and if the nature of right and wrong surpassed space, time, and existence, and if it was as much a fundamental property of reality as math, then why were some things a sin in the Old Testament but not a sin in the New Testament? And Alex, he had no answer, and I realized that I didn't either. Everyone had always explained this problem away using the principle that Jesus' sacrifice meant we wouldn't have to follow those ancient laws anymore. But that wasn't an answer. In fact, by the very nature of the problem, there was no possible answer that would align with Christianity. Now, allow me to quote again the specific portion I wish to address. And she states again, If God was absolutely moral, because morality was absolute, and if the nature of, quote, right and wrong surpassed space, time, and existence, and if it was as much a fundamental property of reality as math, mathematics, then why were some things a sin in the Old Testament, but not a sin in the New Testament? Well, she carries here a small suitcase, but there is much to unpack, okay? And in a sense, she is so vague in her statements that it's almost a waste of time responding simply for the reason that I can only respond by assuming I understand precisely what she means. For instance, she says, God is absolutely moral, yet she fails to define morality. Is she operating from a Christian perspective when she speaks of morality or from an atheistic perspective? I mean, I assume a Christian perspective due to the timing of this question she asked her friend, you know, because she was a professing believer at the time. Nevertheless, the implications do abound. I can also ask her, what is moral? Is it an absolute moral to abstain from fornication or to say excuse me after burping or to keep the Sabbath? Is it immoral to kill a black widow or to use cuss words? I mean, I don't know because she doesn't define morality for us. How does morality apply to God? Right? I mean, is stealing immoral? How can stealing apply to God when he owns everything? Is it an absolute moral issue to obey one's parents? Well, God doesn't have parents who need to be obeyed, right? Next, she seems to imply that morality, whatever the thing is, stands outside of God. Notice her words. She says, if God was absolutely moral because morality was absolute. God is moral because morality is absolute? The next line seems to further establish my conclusion. She writes, if the nature of right and wrong surpassed space, time, and existence, well, if morality surpasses each of these things, then it would seem that such a thing is eternal and self-sufficient, especially since, according to her, this thing called morality doesn't seem to find its source in God. Where, then, does morality come from? Is it eternal and self-sufficient? 
Does this make morality a god itself? If so, how can there be two gods? If there are two gods, how is it that one can rule over the other? Does this god called morality even know that it exists? Since moral law implies a lawgiver, can this god enforce its laws? If it cannot enforce its laws, how can its laws bind to the other god? If Jehovah God can disregard moral God's laws, would this not make Jehovah God the absolute moral objectifier, thus nullifying the moral God's existence? I mean, I believe I made my point clear. Rachel never really thought things through. Her main problem is that she assumed things she should never have assumed. Faulty assumptions lead to faulty reasoning, which ultimately leads to faulty conclusions. Why does she assume all laws are moral in nature? Why does she assume all laws are eternal and unchanging? Where did she get such an idea? Certainly not from the Bible. As a matter of fact, nowhere in the Bible will you find the phrase moral law. For me, the fact that God's laws clearly do change tells me that one should never assume that laws are necessarily eternal and unchanging. This would seem obvious. The fact that God's laws do change proves that her understanding, that is, what she assumed to be true, was an error. I bring this up because I'm not sure why she didn't simply question her assumptions rather than question God's existence. In other words, it never crossed her mind that she might be wrong in her understanding. It had to, of course, be the Bible's fault. And there's a short pause here because of the limitations of the software of iMovie. Anyway. Well, it is at this point I could simply stop because her entire premise was faulty to begin with. Thus, her conclusions are without foundation. You see, she assumed things that simply are not taught in Scripture. Scripture was not her problem. Her own Ignorance of the Bible was, and that's not meant in a derogatory fashion. Ignorance is just lacking knowledge. But I'm not finished, however. I would still like to address the question which flowed from her faulty premises. Let's look at that once more, the things that she said. She says, why were some things a sin in the Old Testament, but not a sin in the New Testament? Well, I'm going to attempt to keep this as short and as simple as I can. And keep in mind that, quote, short and simple are relative terms. There, I mean, there's just so much that can be included in this discussion, but I simply do not have time, nor do I think you have the patience for it, okay? So we'll keep this dumbed down a little bit, okay? And before presenting my argument, it must be pointed out that various theologians and various schools of thought will differ with me on some points. This will not hinder, though, the thrust or strength of the argument because there is nevertheless a general consensus on this issue. It's only some relatively minor points or variations that separate us. We ask here now, how can something be a sin here but not there? How can God's laws change? Well, the first thing we must do or not do is we cannot begin with assumptions. We must allow the scriptures to form our understanding. And this goes for the Christian and the atheist alike. If we are to be fair with the words of anyone, we must let them say what they say and mean what they mean. This seems obvious, but it's rarely done, okay? And I'm going to give a very brief and simplistic sketch of history. Be sure to read as this is a necessary outline that will help us understand this issue. In the beginning, God created man. He gave them one simple law, don't eat from this tree. Adam disobeyed. Man began making babies after this. These children grew up and eventually we get to Noah. God saw that man's wickedness, which implies broken laws, was great, this wickedness, and so he decided to flood the world. Noah and his family, were spared and they were the ones who repopulated the earth. Up until this point, God did not have a quote people, that is, a specific people in a specific relationship with him until he called Abraham. It is with Abraham that God decided to make a people. However, God would create two different peoples from this one man, Abraham. One would be his physical descendants, who would eventually consist of the physical nation of Israel. The other peoples would consist of his spiritual descendants, anyone who shared the same faith in God as Abraham did, who would make up the spiritual kingdom or the church. 
And God made a covenant with Abraham and gave him a law. Circumcise your offspring. God then made a different covenant with Abraham's physical descendants through Moses. God gave Moses and the Israelites a whole bunch of laws, over 600 of them. And this may seem excessive, but they were given for the purpose of running an entire nation. So keep this in mind. Finally, God created a new covenant established by Christ. Christ and the apostles then gave new laws pertaining to that new covenant. So why this brief history lesson? Well, <laughs> different time periods, different people, different covenants, different laws. In other words, the reason the laws changed is because the circumstances changed. Obviously, laws given to the nation of Israel for the purpose of running a nation have no value under the New Covenant with the Church, which is not a physical nation. Nor would laws concerning the nation of Israel have any value or purpose before that nation existed. And to be sure, not every law given to Israel was, quote, civil in nature. For instance, there were laws regarding animal sacrifices. Though this is nevertheless a national thing in Leviticus 16, why have those laws changed? Why don't Christians sacrifice animals? These types of laws, animal sacrifices, were given for a few reasons, okay? The most important one is that they typified or foreshadowed the sacrifice of Christ. They were forward-looking and were awaiting fulfillment. When Christ gave his life as a ransom, he fulfilled what those animal sacrifices pointed to. Why does this matter? Because once fulfillment has taken place, there is no longer any need for those things which foreshadowed the fulfillment, hence the word fulfilled. <laughs> Thus, laws pertaining to animal sacrifices are no longer binding or enforced, and as a matter of fact, it would be blasphemous for Christians to sacrifice animals now that Christ has come. Two different covenants, two different peoples, two different sets of laws. And these are just a few examples. So where does the idea of unchanging moral law come from? All Christians agree there are laws given by God that seem to reflect His unchanging nature and character. However, such laws are not always easy to discern, you see. The reason for this, as stated above, is that the Bible never calls any laws, quote, moral. For me, and many like me, I look for two main things in Scripture to guide my understanding on this. Number one, are there any laws or sins that appear to transcend time, people, and covenant? And number two, are there any laws that appear to flow directly from aspects of God's nature or character? What do I mean by transcend time, people, and covenant? Well, remember the history lesson I just gave? God had no people. Then God called Abraham. God then had a people called Israel. Lastly, God now has a people called the church. Are there any laws that existed prior to God having a people? While God had a people? And when God changed his people? You know, from Abraham to Israelites to the church? In other words, are there any laws which always were and still remain? And this is important because when God makes a covenant with his people, with a specific people, I should say, the laws which govern that covenant are only given to that specific people. And there is a qualification here. They are not binding on anyone else, you see. So hang tight. There's more after about this 15 seconds, as I explained earlier. A little pause. Enjoy the music. However, here, here's the qualification. If certain laws existed prior to God having a people, and we also find these same laws in every covenant, then these laws would transcend time, people, and covenant. These would be the, quote, moral and unchanging laws. And here are a list of sins given prior to God's having a, quote, people. Covetousness, false worship, murder, adultery or sexual profligacy or immorality, evil thinking, you know, dishonoring to parents, pride and selfishness, lying deceit, having false gods and idolatry, and all those scripture passages are given. And this list is provided by someone named Fred Zaspel. But let me give you another way to see if any laws or sins are specifically connected to something about the nature of God. Okay, here's one more. Two examples should suffice here. Number one, God cannot lie. 
lying is something that is against his nature, and since we are also commanded not to lie, this command seems to flow from God's nature and would therefore be an eternal, unchanging, or moral law. Number two, murder. Scripture tells us that murder is wrong because man is created in the image of God. Now, it seems obvious that such a law against murder is somehow tied to the very nature of God, thus making it an eternal, unchanging, quote, moral law. So it's no coincidence that both lying and murder are at least two of the laws that transcend time, people, and covenant. Murder was condemned before Moses, during Moses, and after Moses, okay? Further evidence, I would say, of their unchanging nature. Now allow me to explain this one more way. And I'm going to utilize Dr. Robert Morey's argument given in his four-part lecture entitled How the Old and New Testaments Relate to One Another. Okay, Dr. Morey speaks about directives and directions. The directives are the eternal, unchanging, moral laws of God. The directions are the specific applications of how various people at various times under various covenants are to follow the directives. The directives remain the same or unchanging while the directions do change. Let me provide an example here. Worship God, right? This is a directive. All people of all time, regardless of covenantal status, are ob obligated to worship God. Now, this is a wonderful law. However, it doesn't provide us with anything useful. Because I have to ask, well, how do I worship God? Where do I worship God? When do I worship God? This is where the directions come into play. The worship of God is something that both covenant Israel had to obey, and it is likewise a law the church must obey. However, the directions are different. The church does not worship God in precisely the same way that Israel did. Israel offered animal sacrifices as part of their worship. The church does not. We offer spiritual sacrifices. Israel was commanded to give a tithe. The church, however, is not. The church goes through Christ in order to worship the Father. Christ is the mediator. Israel went through Moses and the various priests, as they were the mediators. So please keep in mind here that contrary to Rachel's understanding, there are no laws outside of God, okay? In other words, laws do not exist independent of God. God is not bound by some external standard of right and wrong. God is the standard. Any laws which have an eternal and unchanging nature do so only because they are rooted in God himself. So, Rachel's apostasy took place because she failed to understand some very basic theological issues. This failure did not result from some error, whether theological or philosophical in scripture. This error of hers was a result, as I mentioned before, of her ignorance of the Bible and what it teaches. So let's keep Brother Matt Slick here and his family in our prayers and ask God's mercy and grace upon Rachel. I mean, we all have loved ones, even children, who are on the fast track to eternal conscious torment. Christ was born lived, died, and was raised, that we might be justified. To trust Him and His atoning sacrifice is the only means by which we can be saved from breaking God's laws. Whatever time period or covenant one is coming from. Now if you would, folks, just bow your heads and repeat this prayer after me. I mean it with all your heart. <laughs> just kidding. We ain't gonna play that non-biblical you know, sinner's prayer nonsense. Just playing with you. And this was written by Chris of the YouTube channel Five Point Baptist. So I want to encourage you to go check out his channel, which is all one word, spelled just the way you see it on the screen, because he's got a bunch of excellent videos. I don't know. I think there's over a hundred on there, mostly dealing with the uh, issue of the sovereignty of God and defending that um, but there's other things as well just a lot of good resources so go check him out all right guys catch you later till the next time